Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Kevin Coim uh, here from Tech Ranch sharing with you a, a couple of, we're in a different location today. We're going to be talking about why that is and a bunch of really interesting stuff to, to share today. Um, we'll just get things started. Wanted to make sure to welcome you to the Venture Outfitter Weekly. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about localization, tailoring local products, services, and businesses models to global markets. And we have a special guest for, for sharing about that. Um, what I want to do first off, though, is welcome to the Venture Outfitter. What the Venture Outfitter is for, this is a, you know, this is a program uh, that TechRanch runs that's for supporting entrepreneurs around the world. And we found that a lot of what's possible is to create these bridges across the world and these connections and part of this program is to make it easier for you to connect in to the larger community and stuff like that. I want to make sure that everyone knows that uh, we have a community. We're going to be doing more activity on our Facebook group. So you'll see that coming soon. But uh, we really we want to pull you into the community site. And we got rid of our, our, our Slack channels because they were getting kind of expensive. We launched a new uh, community site. If you're not on it and you want to, you can either use the QR code that's in front of you to go to it, or you can go to techranch.com slash connect. And there's a link to sign up for the community for free. Now we do have programs that if you are in the process of, oh, if you are in the process of working with, uh, you know, you're doing U.S. market entry or whatever it might be like on, on building your business. There are programs on top of that we'd love to tell you about. One of them called the Venture Outfitter Weekly. Um, that I mean, the Venture Outfitter program, which is a low cost program. And then we have other programs on top of that. But we'd love to get you into the community site for free to get started. So there's been a lot of stuff that's happened. The year is... Um, we're interesting, entering into an, what's called an interesting time. I've once heard that may you live in interesting times is supposed to be a curse of sorts in China. And part of the thing that uh, that um, is happening is it's estimated there's more than 300,000 layoffs that have happened. Um, now, I've read both this is a worldwide number, and then I've also read from a different group that this is the US number. And these aren't layoffs like low level employees. These are engineering kind of positions and stuff like that. And we've seen this before, 2008, 2009 here in Austin. There were lots of layoffs. Um, layoffs hit the whole world with the, uh, the downturn in the economy then. But there's some important things that are happening. And I think part of the program that we're gonna be really focused on is how do we actually take advantage of these situations? Or if you got hit by the layoff, what do you do? What do you do? You don't want to drown. You got to figure out something else to do. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, part of the, now that's not the only thing that today's program is about, but part of the value of having all these connections around the world is you can connect into different parts of the world. Many of you know that my first television for my first startup, you know, almost 30 years ago was um, pesos in Mexico. My customer was a bank in Mexico. I was based here. Austin wasn't the Austin that you know and love now, it was like a really hard place to launch a, a high tech startup from. And so I had my first customer in one country away. Um, one of the things that happens when, when the markets are really strong, people don't really innovate very much. But part of what happens when the markets are soft then innovation is in vogue. And this is an opportunity for early stage startups to do. We're going to talk more about that. In fact, this has kind of hit our local community. New Chip, uh, an organization here, uh, one of the accelerators here, hit uh, bankruptcy. They declared chapter seven, which means that they're not really planning on coming back, which is kind of weird. I was surprised to hear about that. But also our one of our local own, and one of the reasons that I'm not at the studio is Dual Works actually just declared Chapter 7 as well. And I'm kind of sad about this because they're, I, as you've heard me advocate for more than a year for that organization, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of hard to see. Um, but I think there's a lot more organizations, both in Austin and around the world, that are going to hit Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Or, or the bankruptcy in general, whether or not it's Chapter 7 or Chapter 11 or one of the other ones. We'll figure out. And part of the thing that we have to ask ourselves is what do we do in terms of this? 
Now, a lot of the concepts about what happened around TechCrunch in 2018, uh, 2008, I kept on, I've got to go a decade earlier, 2008, we saw this party before. This is not the first time we've seen it. We saw it around 2001. And many of you, um, you know, weren't even out of college at that time. But part of what I want to say is we're going to have a number of different things that are happening to support you through this process. And I want to start with a quote. Um, I am actually, I believe a lot in personal training, and I am embarking on another set of personal training myself, because we constantly have to do not just learn the business stuff, but we have to learn what else do we have to do to become better humans. And through becoming better humans, we become better entrepreneurs and becoming better entrepreneurs, we can deal with markets like what we've been presented. And so I want to um, share this provocative th uh, thought or this quote. Uh, that one of my new coaches, uh, the guy that I'm working with, is has said to me, he said, he, who's a direct student of Dr. Moshe uh, Feldenkrais, he said, in the moments when awareness succeeds at being one with the senses, feelings, thought, and movement, the carriage will speed along the right road. Then man can make discoveries, invent, create, innovate, and know. He grasps that his small world and the great world around are but one, and that in this unity, he is no longer alone. Why am I sharing this? I think that we are entering in what to some are going to call difficult times. And it looks like 300,000 people have already lost their jobs. And a lot of the large tech firms that used to be considered, quote unquote, safe, are uh, no longer safe. And so we're embarking on a series of programs that will be applicable not only in the U.S., but other parts of the world for dealing with the change that's coming on. And so in the next three weeks, you're going to see um, Vince Morote is going to talk about the triangle of change, like the internal triangle of change. He'll do that on May 25th. Christia Hoffman, one of our internal um, brand experts, is going to talk about creativity on June 1st. And then uh, Greg Stevens, a coach that I've worked with for more than a decade, um, he's a great, great, great guy. He's going to talk about conflict resolution. You know, these are trying times. Trying times has conflict. How do we actually work through that? So make sure that you're signing up for these programs. This is the sort of stuff. Part of what I'm trying to you know, provoke is this idea that we have to do internal work to deal with the new situations that are causing us to innovate. You know, uh, the world's not like it was just a little bit ago, and it's changing so fast that uh, it's insight like this that it will be helpful for this type of work. And um, we want to make sure that you actually take advantage of, of all these type of things. Um, the uh, and, and if you have other suggestions of people that you'd like to see in the weeks after that, now we're going to hear from a number of different, like uh, we continue to hear from advisors, from you know different types of startup advisors will hear about different types of programs you know over the last couple of weeks we heard from a bunch of entrepreneurs in chihuahua and other parts of mexico to kind of surface some of the innovative activities happening there the week before that we had the secretary of economy of the state of chihuahua that's looking at uh looking at building a, a bridge between the different organizations of diff different different areas different regions in this is what creates innovation you know someone can invent an idea in their basement or in their garage or wherever they invent it but to innovate you have to connect that to the world and so part of what we'll be doing is provoking those type of uh, conversations a lot of them that are internal because the internal stuff is really what drives things forward and i will be taking a lot of these type of messages to the world coming soon to a uh, city near you it uh, looks like I will be in Spain for three or four days, not just June 21st, 22nd. I'll be in Bilbao, Bilbao Spain. The 23rd of, of, of June, I will be in Madrid. And then because I'm going to be there for a few days, I'm going to try to make it over to um, Barcelona with one of our bo uh, points of contact there, as well as in Murcia, which is a new opportunity that's been emerging in um, August 2nd through the 5th, uh, Santiago and Valparaiso, Chile. I'll get to go to some of the first stomping grounds of where Tech Ranch got its start. I was based in Austin, but the first 1,000 entrepreneurs we worked with are in the country of Chile. 
in 2003. So I'm pretty excited about that. Then we'll hop over to the other side of the 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 uh, Andes there and go to Mendoza, Argentina, the 7th and 8th. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that's going to happen in September and October, not confirmed yet, but then I'll be speaking in Inc. Monterey on November 16th and 17th. Um, the importance, you know, me getting to go to all these different places, that's no big deal. The thing that's more important is take advantage of these connection points. You might be looking for customers in these other locations, or you might be in these one of these other locations and want to connect out to the other rest of the part of the world. Part of the thing that we're doing is to make that possible. As well, we have two new TechRanch fellows. We mentioned a little bit to you about them last time. Jose is from uh He's from Venezuela, lives in Paraguay, is going to be fo focusing on building more of the bridges across the Americas, especially the Spanish and English speaking Americas. And so if you hear this program and you'd like to connect in, one of the people to connect into uh, that's kind of leading the charge, and even in front of what I'm able to do, is um, is is Jose. And then Adolfo has a deep technical background in a lot of deep tech in um, in the Mexicali part of Mexico, he will be sharing more, um, uh, he'll be focusing a little bit more on the deep tech parts of Mexico so that we can connect those into opportunities that are here in Texas and other parts of the world. If you want a connection to them, the easiest way to do that will be to go into the community site today after we post this video and just, you know, grab them there. So a lot of times after programs, I say, hey, will you introduce me to that person? Um, we're going to make my life and your life easy. And if you want, really want that, the best way to do, get into the community, go to where the Venture Outfitter uh, Weekly is posted. And then on that, in the show notes that are there, you'll have all those type of possibilities. And But the main thing is, like I said, Jose is more for general Americas. He's kind of, we're calling him, uh, tentatively we're calling him our ambassador. And then Adolfo is going to go more deep tech. So if you're concerned about deep tech and you'd like to find out more about what's happening uh, in this Texas, Mexico confab that we've been mentioning, make sure you do that as well. All right. That is an earful. So I now want to share with you about today's speaker. Um, Sean Hannity, uh, Sharon Hannity is uh, serves as the U.S. Business Representative of the Ministry of Economy Affairs, Transportation, Agriculture, and Venticulture of the German Federal State of Rhineland Palatin. He's uh, he directs the Ministry's Ford Train Office in Austin, Texas. One of the things you notice is a lot of countries are opening up for trade offices here in Austin for the very first time ever, and it's pretty excited. Now, in the in the case of Germany, uh, Germany has had activities here, and we'll get Sean to tell us a little bit about that, because uh, recently uh, he, he was like, hey, Kevin, you should come explore your, your German roots. For many of you that don't know, the Coim last name was Americanized. My great-great-grandfather, father from years, you know, years ago, 1868, landed in, in Galveston from Germany. And and uh, Sean was like, hey, come to this one event. We'll actually get to talk about that. And I, I got to learn stuff about the German heritage of Austin that I never knew. I mean, we have a little bit about that uh, from him, but really has some really interesting things to say. Sean's been working across many different um, uh, places in the world. You know, originally from Los Angeles and California, uh, spent time in Croatia, works for the German government, done, Very um, has opened up businesses for other companies um, all across the Americas and other parts of the world. So um, one of the things that he does is at the same time it's doing the, this representation he's helping uh build bridges just like you've heard from us before back and forth back into you know the state that he represents inside of germany rhineland palatin and then you know making sure that trade happens both ways now what i'm excited about too though is not just this point-to-point -point connection but with his background and insight as we were getting to to talk a few days ago about uh, about getting him to 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 talk and share this insight with you is he has a lot of really, really great experience that we're asking him to be a part of the community so that um, he can share that insight with you. Okay, but let me get out of the way though and say, Sean, welcome. 
Uh, it's good to good to have you here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thanks for being a part of the Tech Ranch Network. Thank you for all the different things that you've already invited me into. Um, welcome today. I, I appreciate it. Uh, tell us just really before we get into the formal stuff, informally, what was sure. this thing that, that you had us do the other day at the German Heritage Center? Yeah, so wine tasting. Yeah, <laughs> our, I know. Our it's, like, market it's great. Our strategy <laughs> is wine, basically. You know, you organize an event, bring some wine, and people will show up. Well, the yeah, ministry... Definitely. The Ministry of Rhineland Faults, um, we call it Rhineland Faults in, in the German language, in English, Rhineland Palatinate. I'll just refer to it as Rhineland Faults. It's easier to pronounce for me. Um, we have sort of four pillars within the ministry, economic affairs, transportation, agriculture, and viniculture, as you mentioned. Why viniculture? Well, Surprisingly, the state of Rhineland Falls produces 70% of all German wine. There's a lot of tradition and heritage um, in that state, which is on the west of the Rhine River. So if you, from a geographic perspective, find Frankfurt. Frankfurt is in another state called Hessen. You go right across the Rhine River that splits um, Frankfurt from Mainz, and now you're in the capital of Rhineland Falls. Other cities in Rhineland Falls are Koblenz to the north, and that's quite interesting. Koblenz and Austin have had a 31-year sister city uh, partnership. So part of the sister cities international in Austin, um, we've had a partnership with the city of, or the city of uh, Austin has had a partnership with uh, Koblenz. And that's been on an educational level and on a cultural level. And every year there's delegations from students at the elementary schools in Austin and in Koblenz the junior high schools and middle schools that partake in these exchange programs. So I was able to do some wine tasting as well with uh, the parents and the administrators this year. So we're, we're leading uh, interesting events and interesting discussions with fabulous wine from the Rhineland Palatinate region or the Rhineland Falls region. It just provides an interesting atmosphere and gets everybody excited. It's funny. It just happens just by chance, just by chance that Tech Ranch has been building venture bridges with places like uh, Rhineland, as well as uh, in South Australia, uh, you know, in Adelaide, another wine region, also with Santiago de Chile, another wine region, um, Mendoza, Argentina, another wine region, Spain, another wine region, um, uh, even Chihuahua, they're actually making wine. So part of the thing that we're doing yeah. is, uh, although you know, uh, one of the you know, beer is great, but the truth, and I and I absolutely love tequila, but one of the things that I think is very special uh, in relational kind of cultures is uh, sitting down and having a, a proper glass of wine together. So I appreciate your your hospitality. Um, let me do this. Uh, thank you for sharing and, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to get out of the way. I'll bring your slides back up so that we can uh, share them and learn all about this uh, this concept of, uh, from your your um, your background. Let's see if I can actually do this on this small screen. At some point, I'm going to have my broadcast studio again, and I can't wait. Okay, well, here we are back to your slides. So um, hop in and just tell us all about it, and I'll, I'll stay out of your way. Yeah, so I thought this topic of globalization could be interesting to the to the greater community, also those that are, are involved in following Tech Ranch. Um, when we speak about globalization, it's really the process of adapting and tailoring your business um, that could be local to also global markets at the same time. I, um, if you want to go to the next slide. I've, I've come into this business of working for uh, a German uh, state government involved in, in economic development and foreign trade. Um, through my passion with international business, I, I come from a, um, a culturally diverse family. My father's American. My mother was born in Croatia. As a child, I spent a lot of time in Croatia as well. I lived there. I played uh, professional soccer in Croatia and other areas of, of Europe as well. And even the language skills that my, my mother brought upon um, myself and my sister really lasted with me into my adult life where I, I wanted to be involved with business at an international level and also have cultural understanding to 
um, as they say in Rome, do as the Romans do and understand the nuances between, for example, how to do business in Germany, how to do business in Mexico, how to do business in the United States if you're a German company. And there are very, um, very detailed differences on that. I had an aha moment about uh, five, six years ago when I was able to represent a German and Swedish company in the United States to help them establish uh, a subsidiary office to develop sales channels. And I found that that was really my bread and butter where I enjoyed um, sort of the boots on the ground, proactive sales and business development. And through that, you make a lot of connections with people. And I'll talk a little bit today about the different levels of connections that are important to make from the local up to regional state and global levels, and even in the online world. So what I'm doing for the Ministry of Rhineland Falls in the United States is directing their foreign trade office in Austin, Texas. Um, I, I advise small and medium-sized businesses from our state in Rhineland uh, faults in the areas of U.S. market entry, economic development, trade and settlement projects. The day-to-day -day business has a lot to do with matchmaking and partnering and getting these businesses in front of the right people that can also help them and carry the torch further or, you know, bring the ball down the court. So that's a little bit about my background and as well as what our purpose is in the United States don't forget, um, I also need to make the government in Rhineland Palatinate happy. So looking for opportunities to bring U.S. companies, investors, startups also into Germany and help steer them towards our state in Rhineland Falls. And it's been a pleasure meeting um, Kevin and, and getting to know Tech Ranch since uh, my transition to Austin, Texas in February and March. And we see a lot of opportunities in collaborating together on this international venture bridge front. Go on to the next slide. So just a quick question, you know, what is globalization? It's a combination of globalization and localization. Uh, just a short phrase I like to keep in the back of my head is think global, but act local. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's really a process of um, creating products and services for the global market while also adapting and tailoring them to your local or, or regional cultural base and, and customs base. Next slide, please. Some examples of globalization, just to establish a, a foundation of knowledge on this matter. Um, I, I like the, um, the Japanese comics because the Americans, the American comics, um, were, were exported to, to Japan towards the end of the uh, 1800s. And now you have this interesting trend in, in pop culture of the manga comics being quite popular, even in Europe, in Germany, uh, and in the United States. And it's a combination of um, expression of art and creativity and storytelling that even other cultures have picked up on and had an interest in in absorbing. Uh, McDonald's is kind of an easy one. They, uh, if you've traveled around the world, you know that the, the hamburgers and the chicken sandwiches are called differently as you go to different country. The ingredients are different, um, especially in, 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 in India. And in Germany, I think they have different menu options like make tasty bacon that you won't find in the United States. And I found traveling from, when, when my wife and I go to Croatia, we've we travel from the southeastern part of Bavaria through Austria and Slovenia, and there's a rest stop close to Ljubljana in Slovenia that we that we get out at and have a coffee. And we're amazed that the the prices in Slovenia are much cheaper than McDonald's in Austria and in in Germany. So those are just some examples. Airbnb has also done this. The first example was when they really wanted to globalize their business. Well, people needed to pay in the local currencies. Uh, not not just dollars for everybody, but adapting it to whatever the currency is in the in the country where Airbnb wanted to do this. And they've continued to build upon this model of localization by offering a lot of local um, bookable options for uh, leisure activities, tourism and and hospitality. Next slide, please. 
So recently I attended a German American business summit put on through the German American Chamber of Commerce South in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And one of the gentlemen on the speaking panel was the US president and CEO of Miele, Jan Heck. And he told a very funny story dating back to the to the mid to late 80s, early 90s, when Miele, as a German manufacturer of home appliances like kitchens, um, vacuums, other types of uh, appliances, was expanding their global footprint, the, the German team, especially the product development people, wanted to push to the US market the standard German ovens. And they didn't realize that the United States had a very important holiday called Thanksgiving, where the size of the turkey matters, and so does the size of your oven. And so he shared a very funny story just about how um, in, in their global pursuits, Miele had to really uh, take a step back and really change the product dimensions to suit, um, you know, the the tastes and preferences for cooking and baking in the United States. Um, and the fact that over the holidays, Americans typically have much wider and deeper ovens for baking Thanksgiving turkeys or, or hams. And they've been quite successful in the United States. Uh, I just learned that they have now secured distribution through Lowe's uh, DIY hardware stores. And Miele has become the leading premium supplier of household appliances in the world. And when we're talking about globalization, um, these are some of the, the, the challenges that many of us are often aware of. And what's interesting is Europeans, you know, love our fast food. They love American movies, American music and American cigarettes, but they didn't like Walmart. And Walmart failed in Germany for a lot of these reasons you, you see on the screen. Um, I had to adjust as well, transitioning from the United States where I was born to Germany, especially during my studies, which was in a very rural area, because businesses closed on Wednesday at, at 12 o'clock and they didn't reopen again. Or things closed at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. on Saturdays and businesses were not open on Sunday. It was that there's actually a law preventing uh, certain types of businesses from being open on Sundays. And Walmart definitely had to. Um, confront these challenges. Uh, also, the, the German culture of shopping is very different than the American culture of shopping. Whereas in the United States, you have really, um, really large outdoor uh, parking spaces. In Germany, you might have to, you know, park on a multi-level uh, parking structure and, and pay for it. Whereas in the United States, it's free to park in front of Walmart. Right. Um, the store designs and, and layouts were also not necessarily what Germans were used to. If you think of the Aldi business model and the Trader Joe business model, which Trader Joe was was bought out years ago by, by the Aldi brothers, these are more of disc, discounter uh, retail layouts where you know the Germans love looking for a deal, um, but they're also looking for quality at the same time. But they're typically, from a cultural standpoint and a, and a consumer behavioral standpoint, not necessarily buying um, in, in bulk all the time, especially not in the sizes that are familiar in the U.S., where you buy milk in a gallon, and in Europe, you're buying in liters, right? So it's very different. Um, and you, you see this a lot in the mentality of businesses that are also wanting to enter the United States. And because of my, my German American business experience, I focus a lot on some of the challenges as well as the pain points German businesses have trying to not only export and trade in the US, but enter and run businesses themselves. We can move on to the next slide. And I think what oftentimes German companies forget is what matters to the customers. Uh, I like this, uh, this image that I found online um, with the with the Dachselhund. You know, Germans are very product driven, very engineering driven, whereas in the United States, doing business is very relationship 
driven, you know, meeting once, twice, three times, four times, and breaking down sort of the um, the personal and relationship barriers and getting to know people on a on a personal basis. And so there's this spectrum that I find, especially with German, Austrian, Swiss companies, is features versus benefits. And I think those of you on the call would argue from a North American North American uh, perspective in terms of buying and selling, you know, what can I get from your product or services is more important than, um, as you see on this graphic, the elongated chassis, or it's a visual communication device. It's an optimized ex excavation mechanism. And I've seen a similar type of joke using, using a fork and having an analogy of the German way and the American way of looking at a fork, which is the Germans might say, you know, we've got this casted alloy metal um, with an aerodynamic and ergonomic handle, whereas the Americans would say, the fork allows me to eat 50% faster, right? That's what matters to the customer. That's what matters to the person. So you have this spectrum of also looking at often in German companies, precision performance, whereas on the American side, it's more about applicability. What is it going to do for me and, and how can I use it to achieve some type of savings? A monetization effect is really important. I, I really like the Miller-Hyman model in strategic selling because it really drives through the monetization effect in a selling environment. Um, what can the party um, achieve in terms of return on investment, in terms of margins, in terms of meeting price points on the market to make their product uh, sell better. And I think a lot of what has attracted German companies to the United States and helped them form these clusters in Alabama and also in the Carolinas is that other Germans and companies that went the way of expanding into the US and were successful, they provided peace of mind to the same type of cultural businesses, giving them a place in the Carolinas. For example, there's over 200 businesses from Germany, Austria, and Charlotte. And a lot of them keep coming there simply because of the peace of mind that their peers will help them make it in the US. But that's not enough. You have to really cover all of these uh, criteria that I'm mentioning here on this slide and really connect with people on the relationship side. So I wanted to give a, a, an example of something that I've been working on recently that covers really everything that I'm talking about uh, during this podcast and, and really is a great example of globalization. Uh, back in February, when I first met Kevin in Austin, I ran down to San, Mar to San Marcos for the Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association annual trade show. And I did my homework before the show. There were about 100 exhibitors, and I spent a week going to all of their websites and really looking for connections that would stand out, something innovative, something different. I wasn't really there so much for the wine and the tasting of the wine. I really wanted to look for innovative stuff that was happening in the commercial wine industry. And one of the traditional uh, cooperage suppliers worldwide, T and Cooperage uh, from Chile, they work with a gentleman called Kirk Bauer from Kirk's Total Wine in our state of Rhineland Falls. Kirk has been in the wine business for over 20 years and is a significant traditional wine barrel uh, supplier in Rhineland Palatinate, Germany, as well as um, countries like France, Italy, Belgium, and Luxembourg. While I was at the show, I saw this product, which was an alternative barrel from Modern Cooperage out of California that just looked totally German. The way it was welded, the, the outer features, as well as the sample they had on the trade show floor of a cross section to actually see inside what's happening, where you have this lever and rotation system where you can insert oak staves. And I went up to uh, to Jared, who was the who was the, the owner and vice president of sales in Modern Cooper, and I said, is this produced in Germany? He says, no, we produce it in the United States. I said, well, it looks totally German. It looks German engineered. It actually looks over engineered because it's really so cool and so attractive. And what's been interesting over the past two to three months is during this trade show, 
modern cooperage had absolutely no real interest in going international, going global with their product. And I dived into a conversation with, with Jared from modern cooperage about, you know, the potential of placing this product in a, in a traditional Oak wine barrel market and how innovation could really drive change. I see this as really innovative um, for many reasons. And I've now over the course of a couple months had facilitated uh, multiple virtual conversations and meetings with Modern Cooperage and Kirk's Total Wine to where over the course of two, three months, we're now at the point of Kirk's Total Wine um, executing distributorship on behalf of Modern Cooperage in rhineland Pfalz, as well as other wine growing regions in Germany, but also serving as a master distributor to open the markets in France, Italy, Luxembourg, and Belgium, where Kirk's Total Wine is also present buying and also distributing French oak barrels and placing them at top wineries across Europe. And so in this case, you have an example of innovation um, working itself into the traditional wine barrel uh, industry, but there's a sustainability element that is very important. Since 2018, the availability of oak, especially French oak, has decreased on the market. And wineries have needed to start looking into the future about how are we going to take better use of our resources to still be able to age our wines in barrels. It's also a very interesting bilateral trade example. It's a beautiful example because in Rhineland Fouts, you have untouched oak forests, which could be harvested to use not necessarily for the whole barrel, but in an economical and environmental friendly way, just producing the staves that can be inserted to create the oak aroma and the flavors. And this whole system with the, the stainless steel barrels using uh, oak staves is really a, a cost reduction on the wood side. It also has a lower shipping footprint because typically wineries will rotate their wooden barrels uh, at 25% 20 rate of their current stock. So there's always new rotations coming in because the wooden barrels are lasting five, seven years, whereas the stainless steel barrels, they can last 25 to 30 years. And so at the same time, you're lowering your, your CO2 footprint and also your shipping footprint by not having to ship so frequently large wooden barrels that are that are simply empty in transport. They're not carrying anything. And also when you go from one wine uh, wine sort to the next and during the maturation process, you use a lot of water to clean the, the barrels themselves. So with the stainless steel barrels, it's much easier to clean them with less water. So I thought this was a really beautiful example of modern cooperage not really thinking two, three months ago of going international and how this one product could be applied globally, where there's a wine market, as well as a beer market, and how country to country, you could also tap the local resources. Uh, for example, in Croatia, um, Kirk was telling me the story of uh, a family in the wine business that bought up a bunch of forest land uh, for oak production. And so you could use the local resources in this model as well. So I found this to be really a, a very modern and interesting example that I wanted to share. Next slide, please. So using this example of Kirk's Total Wine and, and Modern Cooperage kind of is a good segue into the power of networking, which also reflects what I've done in, in my work and my role with uh, Rhineland Faults in really hitting the ground running in Austin and trying to meet as many people as possible. I kind of look at the, the end result I want and then try to work backwards to achieve all of those contact points that I wanted. So when I came to Austin for the first time in February, it was just a business uh, trip to kind of navigate potential uh, office space, to meet with the Austin Chamber of Commerce, to meet with um, the, the honorary German consul, Dorothy Mitchell, who is part of the Foster's group that does immigration services in 
in Austin and the state of Texas, and to also connect with the state level chamber of commerce with the Texas Association of Business. And interesting enough, people know other people, and that's how I met Kevin. I was waiting for a meeting on the rooftop, and a gentleman from the Texas Association of Business sent Kevin up to the rooftop to, to come meet me, and that's how we started um, collaborating with each other. So I truly believe in really uh, opening yourself up to uh, networking situations. I, I try to break it down for myself, and I recommend this to German companies coming into the United States. You need to really find the people at the local level. That could be uh, local offices of economic development, uh, chambers of commerce, and you have those same organizations also at the state level, right? Then you have your different industry and trade associations. In Germany, you have the equivalent manufacturing trade associations. You have the equivalent um, wood building and craftsmanship associations, electrician associations. And those are really important to connect with too because they represent the needs of those types of businesses from a manufacturing standpoint or a mechanical engineering standpoint in Germany that also want to tap potential in the North American market. So on the state, local economic development and chamber of commerce sides, you also have regional uh, partnerships and offices. A good example is that in, in Houston, you have the Greater uh, Houston Partnership and Charlotte. Over the last couple of years, the Charlotte Chamber has merged into the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance that even goes into the neighboring state of South Carolina, representing, I believe, Lancaster County, uh, Rock Hill, and Fort Mill, South Carolina. Um, and so all of these trade organizations and offices of economic development also exist at a global level. For example, our trade office in Austin through Rhineland Falls is also in collaboration with our state ministry in Mainz, as well as Vietnam, China, Rwanda, Poland, and Israel. So in all of those international locations, there's an individual like myself who handles bilateral trade between Rhineland Palatinate in Germany and Israel, for example. And I, I would not underplay the possibility of business in Texas, business in Austin, um, that could also relate to Germany and it could also relate to Israel. So don't forget about the crossover and the overlap into other markets on the global scale. And obviously, you know, I don't have to tell all of you this with digitalization. There's so much networking you can do um, online through LinkedIn. Um, these types of, of networking sessions that we're doing through a podcast with um, Tech Ranch Austin today. So I just wanted to round up the, the discussion. We can open it up to more dialogue and questions. But I think the, the main takeaways, if you're a, an entrepreneur, a business owner, or even a, a business manager or an executive, uh, handling international expansions is to think global, think international, and, and still maintain your local to local activities. Um, one of the largest challenges for German companies coming to the United States has been uh, adapting to the culture, right? A lot of companies from Germany and Austria, they try to do business in the United States as a German company, and those are the ones that typically uh, typically fail. And I think what we covered on some of the, the earlier slides, what really matters, define what the opt, what the other party can obtain, what they can get from, from you, and re what really matter to, matters to them. We talked about in the previous slide, networking multipliers, trying to find how to multiply um, vertically and also horizontally um, your, your contact network, which may be in, in industry sectors or government uh, nonprofit sectors as well. I've also found fantastic networking opportunities through the World Affairs Councils that have different uh, regional offices, for example, in Austin, in Dallas, and in Columbia, South Carolina. 
The last point I wanted to say was giving back. And this is really special to me because what I found in Charlotte and was a reason for why years ago I ended up opening a, a business for a German manufacturer in Charlotte was the way I was received in the community and how willing so many um, business representatives of German US companies were giving me their time and resources and contacts without asking anything in return. And the payback is exponential if you have this mindset and you're giving back to others and not necessarily looking at how can I profit from this contact or how can I profit from this opportunity to interact, but having the mindset, what can, what can I give back? And what I'm really interested in developing with this community who's involved in this podcast today is no matter which company or country is coming into Austin, that we work to collectively as sort of an industry team to represent them with open arms, to make them feel comfortable, to make them understand that you have a peer group here and that will help you get the contacts you need, will help you um, put you in front of people that can provide funding, not necessarily asking anything in return. And I think that is very dynamic in growing our ecosystem here in Austin. And I've seen it work in, in Charlotte. Thank you very much for your attention and participating. I'm happy to take any questions you guys have. Let's do this. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And then um, what we'll do is uh, if there are other members of the studio audience that would like to ask questions, we'll bring them on. As well as we have uh, we have individuals that are watching the Facebook and the LinkedIn streams. Uh, we'll do a couple of shout outs. Uh, Joe Blackman said, Rhineland has excellent wine. I've been to Maine's. Um, and uh, <laughs> he said, good luck. We actually have uh, one of our Uzbek um entrepreneurs all the way from uzbekistan who's watching uh his name is kabir so to tashkent uzbekistan shout out to kabir uh howdy and then north texas really far away melvin hall up in north texas but uh have all done little shout outs on on the linkedin stream um the thing that uh that the thing that I'd like to start with a question or two, and like I said, if anyone else has questions that's in the studio audience, raise your digital hand first off so that I can catch you. But uh, part of what I'd like to ask is, um, so you were talking about some of the challenges, like the the German company that tries to come to the United States and you know and and do business in the German style in, in the U.S. I've seen the same thing where you know the U.S. company goes to Mexico. I learned the hard way. You know, you can't exactly do business U.S. style in Mexico for my first customer. You know, I learned that the hard way or when I was in Chile or any of the other places. What are some of the other challenges? Like what what would be like, is there anything that you could say just um, a, a short orientation that might save uh, a lot of what I'd like to joke about is to say, hey, we've got scar tissue to donate to you so you don't have to get it yourself. Any other scar tissue you'd like to speak from? Yeah, so if I if I can refer just to a handful of of opportunities that I kind of have now on our pipeline, companies that have reached out to me um, directly after finding out, okay, Ryland Falls has now somebody in the United States. He's offering free consulting services as a state government. Let's let's speak to him. Um, what I typically find though over and over that repeats itself is that um, a lot of companies from Germany and Austria have been in the United States by kind of throwing their business over the Atlantic and saying, dear distributor, dear importer, do it for me. And with the hopes that it's just gonna take off like that. The, the risk of that is that you put all of your eggs in one basket. The other thing is if you're not here physically, you don't really learn how to develop your business. You don't learn how to sell the different channels. You don't learn what is leading to executing a business relationship because you're relying on somebody else to do it for you right right um so one thing that was interesting for the commercial wine uh business i i got in contact with a wine group from germany that represents uh co-ops as well as premium brands um, and they tried to place those business brands into the hands of u.s uh, importers for for wine. Well, there's kind of two different ways to go. You have either the, the the classic importer model that just buys the wine and marks it up at whatever 
margin the, the, the distributor and importer wants to have for his own business and then sells it on to a reseller who sells it on to you know, the supermarket and they all mark it up. And, and then eventually you have wine that's in the 40 to $80 range and you're not selling volume. There's another philosophy of working with a, a service importer model who will then guide you step-by-step step in the go-to-market strategy, looking what price do you as the producer want to achieve rather than what price I want for my own profitability? Uh, and what's the go-to-market strategy in terms of positioning the product? In which channels are we going to do online? Well, which online channels? Are we going to do supermarkets? Are we going to do hotels? Are we going to do um, high-end restaurants? And also, what are the price points? So I think it provides two philosophies, two two paths. I know companies in the United States like Skernik who have a lot of Austrian and German wines. They're very, very selective in who they work with. They work with wineries that have 80 hectares or less and are very exclusive, very premium. Well, also the prices are much higher on the market. Whereas a service importer might be more involved in mass distribution rather than selective and have pricing between you know, 10 to $12 for a bottle of wine. So to kind of wrap up those two different extremes of throwing your business over, you know, over the fence and having somebody else do it to um, positioning it strategically with different, with different types of, um, let's say, market activators, market executors, is you really need to know your business in that country and you really need to be physically present and spend some time to establish the, the personal relationships rather than just, just saying, we have a fantastic product. It's proven itself in the Dach region across Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, and even into the Czech Republic and Poland. You know, we have all of the certification. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be taken up right away in the United States where people are, you know, they want quality products, but they also want to know what can it do for me? And how can I make money with it? How can I how can I reduce how can I reduce my costs? It's interesting, especially with something as complex as wine can be, as simple and as complex as wine can be, about seeing all the different layers of that. That's that's it's interesting. I'm I mean, in my my own case, I'm a small time investor in a winery in Washington State, and I I, I can see that that there's certain ways that uh, this end of the spectrum or the, the the low end of the market, the high end of the market, might end up uh, requiring different type of interactions. Are there uh, any other um, any other breakdowns that you'd point to that uh, that we should know about? Or actually, you know what we could do is we have a question that came in from Alex Romero. Uh, let me just read that here. It says, it's, uh, it's so interesting. What's your opinion about corporate venture capital in Germany, big companies investing in startups? Let's We'll switch to that. We'll switch to that other thing because I, I could ask you a thousand questions on the other line. But let's, let's see what um, one... Uh, Alex's question and uh, see what your thoughts are about that. It's a great question. And it's, it's very fitting because um, earlier this morning, I had a, a call with a German guy who runs a, a branding agency in the United States. He's been here for years. And we were talking about the, the relationships between technology companies, startups and investors here and how that's missing in Germany. If, 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 Another hurdle in Germany, if I want to start a business, is I have to forecast and pay in advance the financial authorities, and my my um, extrapolations and forecasts are based on how much tax I'm going to be paying quarterly in advance. So before I'm even making money, I'm having to pay the pay the German government, and so there's a really great opportunity for organizations like Tech Ranch Austin to fill this void and to be driving bilateral um, bilateral investment uh, projects that go into countries, locate, harvest those startups and help them through, let's say the, the case studies and hero stories of the past to gain a better startup culture and financial uh, footing in the home country, but also offering those countries the opportunity to grow and expand also in the United States. Yeah. And also consulting them on the cultural standpoint as well, because 
we use TechRanch as an example, um, you're, you're traveling to very diverse uh, countries that have different cultural dispositions from Europe to Asia to Latin America and South America. Yeah, and it's it's always been interesting because um, you know, I <laughs> as many places as I've been, I I think the one thing that it's taught me is that I know that I don't know, you know, <laughs> I don't I know that I don't know another culture and therefore I have a chance at possibly learning something, right? I think that's one of the things that I'll say to uh to my fellow fellow countrymen or to anyone else. You know, it, when we when we learn the hard way, actually, in my case, I learned the hard way. I don't know, you know, as, even growing up in a Mexican-American culture in San Antonio, I learned the hard way. I don't know, um, you know, 30 years ago that I knew how to do business in Mexico. Um, and yeah, when you start there, when you start there, which is hard for us to all do, right? We're all entrepreneurs. We believe we, you know, we can do it and all that sort of stuff. We're blind, we're blind to our blindness sometimes. It's interesting to see. You've you've definitely gotten to stand in a bunch of different places, you know, ever there from California to Germany to Croatia and all that sort of stuff. How have you done that? How have you figured it out? Oh, wait, I'm screwing up or or whatever it might be. Or how, how, how or not, in your case, it might not be that you did it my way of screwing up. Let me reframe that. And that's that's clearly my way. Just keep on knocking my head against the wall until I realize, oh, wait, there's a wall there. What about your way? How did you discover this sort of stuff, being a, a culturally attuned? Yeah, I mean, I, I had experiences early on through sports, through through soccer, or if you want to call it, you know, European football, that really taught me. Um, you know how to how to how to react when you're thrown into cold water. When I when I went to Europe as a, as a as a teen, I didn't know Croatian very well to really have a conversation. And I'm in the locker room. I'm in the changing room with a bunch of guys. And the, you know who's the new guy? And um, a lot of times in these personal situations and social settings, you know where even in networking, you know, both sides are kind of uncomfortable. I took the approach of trying to make other people comfortable, even though I was uncomfortable <laughs> and, and giving, giving them their comfort level or, or making it easier for them. You seem to kind of ease into these situations, but I think it takes, a, it takes a mindset. I mean, I grew up with the, with the, with the international mindset um, to be, um, you know, aware of different cultures, to be tolerant of them. My my Croatian family was very, very poor. I remember when we went over to Croatia when it was still Yugoslavia and we flushed the toilet by pumping water outside, carrying a bucket and, you know, disposing of the wastewater in, in, in that method. Um, so that, you know, gave me insight into how people live in other parts of the world, what, what opportunities they have or do not have. Um, but I've strived in my 20 years almost in Germany to integrate at, at all costs. Even when I uh, was preparing for my move to Germany during my MBA studies, I was learning intensive German on top, on top of my regular coursework. And when I went abroad, I, I dedicated myself to really uh, studying the language and mastering the language. I had the the liberty of working in the real estate industry, which exposed me to a lot of technical German language in the form of um, real estate contracts, real estate valuations, where I needed to really understand the legal framework and, and the, the technical language. Um, but I, I do that even today by just reaching out to people. You have the German Texan Heritage Society in Austin, Texas. I, I go online to Facebook and I find the group's uh, Germans in Austin. There's also a group called Croatians in Austin, and they had a, a pig roast and picnic uh, last weekend that I went to. So you have to kind of throw yourself out there. But I think you also need to be willing to jump into cold water and swim and be okay with that. And there's pain points in the beginning, but I look at it as, you know, the, the discomfort or the pain is temporary. And there's an, an acclimation phase, right? The yeah, analogy wait, in Germany is you don't eat a salami all at once. You cut it off in pieces, right? <laughs> exactly. Wait, it's, in, it's interesting because then that growth process, 
you know, for me, it's become such a joy, just such a joy to, to rediscover something. I mean, you know, getting to go, um, since we have uh, one of our Uzbeks here, then they're watching um, on the other side of the world. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, same thing when I was there, it just was, it can become such a delight. So, Hey, yeah. we have one more question. And what, what, what we'll do is, um, I'll get you to say a few final words and just to anyone that's in the studio audience, just as a reminder, if you want to ask some other questions that are, that are off of the camera, um, uh, we'll ask Sean to stick around for just a little bit, but, sure. um, um, or, or I will ask him to stick around after we, we, uh, we cut the, the channel, but, uh, how does Germany's collaboration models work, i.e. trade benefits with the European Union for Mexican or American startups? Alex Romero had a follow on question. Um, what are your thoughts about that? How, how, how do those work? Like, what's the possibility that, you know, by if a, a U.S. based or a Mexican based uh, company wanted to leverage um, landing in your part of Germany? Um, what what's then possible into the EU for that organization? Yeah, so. Country to country, you would always have the, the federal level. And if they're part of the European Union, you would have, you know, European European Union commissions that provide incentive as well, incentives as well. The European Union has generated a lot of uh, incentive programs and funds, especially for the younger um, European Union countries. A lot of that funding has gone into Poland. So you see a lot of... Um, businesses from the United States that will set up some type of subsidiary or operation in Poland. And the, the, the country of Poland has been very successful in facilitating winning those grants. Um, I'm aware of a, of, a, of a company in the United States that um, has ties to Poland and helps U.S. companies apply properly for European Union grants, it's it's a science and um, an art to do these grant processes. And so this, this company that I'm mentioning works as a consultant and takes consultant fees to help US companies get funding. It's typically in um, sort of the similar fields that the United States is looking for investment in, like in, 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 the, in the STEM, the science, technology, um, forget what the, abbreviation is for STEM, science, technology, is it environmental, <laughs> mathematical? Math, math. Yeah, yeah. Math. But really, I can refer to them as, as high potential economic uh, economic sectors. And so the, the, the two questions actually kind of tie into each other about, you know, what's with the, the corporate venture capital in Germany and what are kind of the trade benefits and how can we tap into that if it's an American, if it's an American company or a Mexican company. The European landscape is really missing this venture capital driven um, support for for startups. I give you the example that in our state of, of Rhineland Falls, the state government in Mainz has funded a startup hub called Gutenberg Digital Hub. So the, the CTO, Chief Technology Officer for Stadtwerke Mainz, which is the, the state utilities company, is also uh, responsible for Gutenberg Digital Hub, which provides sort of a, a, an incubation and an office location for startups that need a place to work out of that are also um, receiving government subsidies to grow their, their startup business. So the governments at the state level are, are a good resource, and they will also work which, with organizations that are called e IHKs, um, it's kind of, it's, it's the, in German, they call it the Handelskammer, um, the, the Indus, industry Handelskammer, the industry, uh, trade association or, or industry, um, chamber of commerce. And they get broken down then to the city and regional level. So in our state, we have in Koblenz, we have in Mainz, we have in the Faltz region, we have in Trier, separate offices of the IHKs who are doing kind of the country level uh, economic development and providing um, incentives. And those will differ um, region to region and state to state, just like they do in Texas. In Texas, you have 1,200 offices 
uh, or you have 1,200 chambers of commerce, but only about 450 of them actually do economic development. And those that are doing economic development themselves, they're obviously competing with each, with each other to bring business to that state. And that's and that's why you see a lot of these German and Austrian manufacturing clusters in rural areas in in the Carolinas as well as in Alabama. They're not necessarily all in Birmingham or all in in the the larger metropolitan areas, they branch out to rural areas where they can get uh, great benefits, tax tax reductions, tax incentives. Interesting. Well, and so it's, it's interesting that one of the things that as people are hearing about this, you know, my case as an example, I had my first my first um, uh, customer was in Mexico. And the way that I'm framing these things is I think about, about uh, what Sean's telling us is, Having access to a person like himself for doing that first level of discovery, for even finding out how you plug in to 10. I mean, in my case, 30 years ago, I got lucky, totally got lucky. You know, I had a uh, had a had that connection into Mexico that gave me that first really advanced customer, you know, and that first quarter million dollar customer actually put me on my uh, pathway to success long term as an entrepreneur. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, what we'll do is, um, is we'll have Sean available in the future. I'm definitely, uh, I, I was talking to him, you know, the, the other night about saying, hey, let's, uh, we'd love to actually pull you in uh, more because of your knowledge as well as because you're representing uh, Rhein um and, and Germany in general. And then you have so much experience about this. Um, we'll be asking him to be a part of the community and we'll have him back. Um, Sean, any last Closing words you'd like to say before we close up the uh, the venture outfitter for the day? I, I would say now is the perfect time to consider investing in in German businesses. They are so hungry for that collaboration with the North American investment community at the South by Southwest. There were a lot of German startups at the German Pavilion on rotation. I'm still in contact with many of them now. Even though not all of them are from my state of Rhineland Falls, I still told them I'll, I'll help kind of navigate you to the right people and put you in front of you know potential investors. There is really a lot of a lot of demand. So anybody that's interested in navigating bilateral trade between um, you know their their city, their state, their region, and um, Germany. Now, I'm happy to be a point of contact for you, even if it in the end takes you to Bavaria or Berlin instead of Rhineland Falls. The point is international connections and to keep driving Austin as an international community, because then we all have something to profit from and we get something in return. Exactly. I concur with that fully. Well, Sean, thank you very much for being a part of today's program. I greatly thank appreciate it. Thank you for inviting it. me. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I look forward to the next time we get to sit down and enjoy wine together, um, whether it's from London or some other parts of part of the world. I definitely look forward to it. Um, talking to you all the time is just uh, is really I learn every time myself and I'm 30 years into the doing this stuff internationally and I still learned a lot from today. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So. Cool. So what we'll do is we're going to round, wrap up today. I already know a few people from in the in the community said uh, that they had to go ahead and step out. We're right at 12.09. So what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and bring up the, uh, the last few slides. Um, if you want to get involved in the community uh, or some aspect of the community, whether you're a mentor candidate, you'd like to get involved in representing this work to another country in the world, uh, we have a country manager program that you can apply for um, there online. The URL is to go to techranch.com slash connect as well. The, the key thing to do is there is a free entry point into the community here. We're going to start publishing a lot more of this type of activity just because, um, like Sean was just mentioning, the um, there's so much of an opportunity back and forth, back and forth. And in my case, it's just by chance that I got that first customer and the customer ended up being a country away that uh, I would actually suggest that looking deeper into this, especially in this time of need, one of the studio audience uh, members actually mentioned this as well. That uh, here in Austin, um, one of the uh, one of the consulting companies is about to lay off another 500 people. That's just been predicted um, in June. So um, we're definitely entering into rougher times, 
And connectivity is one of the ways of actually solving that. So go to techmanage.com slash connect, get connected into our community. And uh, we definitely have an opportunity to work together on, on that. And with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to the last slide. Last slide is to say uh, it's it's been great to get to have Sean on the program today, as well as we'll continue to have the next three programs are going to be all about how to engage in the skills that are going to help you get through some of the rougher moments. You know, the triangle change with, with Vince, followed by creativity with Christia, followed by conflict resolution with, uh, with um, Greg. So make it a point to actually get involved in the next three weeks. We'll then go back to some more of an industrial focus. We have other um, countries, areas of both Mexico and other parts of the world that we're going to actually start surfacing some more activities around. Um, if you have specific things that you'd like to see us do, make it a point to actually share with us what you're interested in, and we'll do our best to do that. And with that, let me go ahead and say it's always my honor to be a part of a group of entrepreneurs that are driven by vision and values. Let's go change the world for the better together. With that, y'all take good care. Stick around if you're in the studio and on. You can ask him, Sean some other questions. Other than that, for the rest of the world, y'all take care. Have a wonderful day, evening, or night. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.